Let's go ahead and review the full theory that we've been developing now. So this is uh, mechanical theory for the deformation of in multi-dimensions. And to keep things simple, we'll kind of restrict ourselves to two dimensions. That'll keep the writing a little bit manageable. Um, first of all, we have introduced nine variables into the theory. So two displacements, one in the x, one in the y, three strains, so two normal strains and a shear strain, and four stresses, two normal stresses and two shear stresses. In terms of equations, uh, we have first the kinematic relationships. Those are the two expressions for the normal strains in terms of the displacements. And then the expression for the shear strains in terms of the displacements. So that gives us three equations. Now we also have three equilibrium equations. Some of the forces in the x, some of the forces in the y, and some of the moments about the z. So if we look at that, we have nine variables, six equations. So there's three missing relationships. Uh, to our setup here, which we're going to have to fill in to come to a complete theory. Now, just to remind ourselves, if we consider the 1D case, in the 1D case we had one displacement, u, one strain epsilon, and one stress sigma. So that's three variables. There is one kinematic relationship, which told us that the strain is equal to the derivative of the displacement with respect to position. And then there is one equilibrium equation. So I've written that in this form over here, uh, that the derivative of sigma a plus b equals zero. And so there's a, there are three variables and two equations. And the missing equation that completed our set before was the constitutive equation, namely that sigma is equal to e epsilon. And that's essentially what we're going to need here in the full multidimensional theory is the missing relationships are going to be constitutive relations. So in the 2D case, there are going to be three constitutive equations that we have to specify. Um, now, if we were doing the 3D case, it turns out that there are 18 variables, three displacements, nine stresses, and six strains. And there are 12 equations in terms of the kinematics, namely there's six kinematic equations and six equilibrium equations. So there are six missing equations in the 3D case. So in the 3D case, we're going to need six constitutive equations to complete the theory. So let's have a look at multidimensional material response. And let's go ahead and consider just a bar of material that we pull an extension with the force P in the x direction. So now, if I do that, I'm going to get some extension in the x direction. But if I also look carefully at this, I'll also get some contraction in the y direction when I do this in reality. So you can try that with a rubber band or something, and you'll see that quite clearly. And so in multi-dimensions, there are lots of different effects that one has to take in to account. And in this case, in particular, if I've looked in this in two dim dimensions, I have a strain in the x direction. So there's a normal strain, which I could represent as the normal stress in the x direction divided by the Young's modulus. But when I do that, I also get sort of a parasitic effect in the y direction. So I get a normal strain in the y direction, which is proportional to the normal strain in the x direction. And that constant of proportionality we write down as nu, and it's called the Poisson ratio. And the Poisson ratio is, lives between minus 1 and 1 half for real materials. So it can never actually get to 1 half. And it's pretty rare to see negative values. But there are some materials that have negative values. So a negative value would mean that when I pulled on this bar of material in the x direction, instead of contracting in the y direction, it would have actually expanded in the y direction. So it's not too common. But it can happen for some specially engineered materials. Now. In multi-dimensions, of course, I, I don't just apply loads, say, in the x direction, but I could also apply loads in the y direction. And so if I did that, I would get some additional contributions to the strains. So in the y direction, if I applied a stress in the y direction, I would get a contribution to the strain, which was the stress, the normal stress in the y direction divided by the Young's modules. And then I would have this sort of parasitic effect in the x direction, which would be the normal strain in the y direction due to the stresses in the y direction times this constant of proportionality, the Poisson ratio. And I could also go ahead and account for loads in the z direction, and that produces extra terms. We'll also get a z strain, which has two Poisson terms plus the direct strain due to the load in the z direction. And then I'd pick up Poisson terms for the strains in the x and in the y direction. So that gives, this gives us. Uh, a complete look at what happens in three dimensions for what are known as linear elastic isotropic materials. Uh, now, of course, there are also shear strains. And the shear strains are always proportional to the shear stresses. 
through the shear modulus, which is we use the symbol G to represent. Um, just as a quick remark, uh, G is actually not an independent material property. You can relate it to the Young's modulus. It happens to have this relationship here. It's E divided by 2, 1 plus nu. And we'll actually prove that a little bit later. Um, you'll notice that I, if you count the equations, there's six of them. So we have six stress-strain relations. And these relationships are known as linear elastic isotropic. So linear elastic because it's elastic material, as they're written. So if I remove the stress, the strains go away. And the relationships between the stresses and the strains are strictly linear equations. And so this is also sometimes known as the three-dimensional version of Hooke's law. And we say isotropic because the response to the material is the same. So if I pull it in the x direction, I get a direct strain in the x direction that's the stress divided by the modulus. But if I do the same thing in the y direction, the direct strain is also the stress divided by the same modulus. So it's the same modulus in each direction. And likewise, the Poisson effects, I'm assuming, are the same in all directions. And isotropic materials are pretty common. Uh, polycrystalline metals all come as isotropic materials at the macroscopic scale. And then things like amorphous polymers also behave in an isotropic fashion. So lots and lots of materials are isotropic. Though one should be aware that there are anisotropic materials, those where you have different moduli in different directions. But we won't uh, entertain those cases in this course. Um, one other thing about moduli is that the Young's modulus and the shear modulus aren't the only moduli out there. Uh, there's another very common modulus you should be aware of, which is known as the bulk modulus. And that relates pressure to volume, so in, in particular to volumetric strain. Uh, now, just as definitions, pressure is defined to be the mean normal stress. So that's one-third times the trace of the stress tensor. So one-third times sigma xx plus sigma yy over sigma zz. And the volume strain is the trace of the strain tensor. So it's the sum of the three normal strains taken together gives you what's known as the volumetric strain. And the bulk modulus connects these two quantities together. So its pressure is equal to bulk modulus times theta, where theta is the volumetric strain. And we can actually relate uh, the bulk modulus to the other moduli we've already introduced by just simply using the full 3D equations that we have from before. So theta is equal, if I add up epsilon xx, epsilon yy, and epsilon zz from the, the previous slide, so let's just go back for a second. So if I, if I take these three relationships and just sum them, then on the left-hand side, I'm going to get the volumetric strain. And then on the right-hand side, I'm going to collapse all the terms that you're looking at. So if I go ahead and do that, I'll find that I have E divided into the trace of sigma. And then I'll pick up two Poisson terms, minus nu over E times trace sigma, minus nu over E times trace sigma. So trace sigma is just a shorthand for the sum of epsilon xx plus epsilon yy plus, or sorry, sigma xx plus sigma yy plus sigma zz. And now I can co collapse these terms a little bit. And if I do that, I find that theta is equal to 3, 1 minus 2 nu over E times P. And so now I can extract out that the bulk modulus is E over 3, 1 minus 2 nu. So, but the mo bulk modulus you'll find in tables and material properties and things like that. So it's a useful thing to know about. Um, one last thing I want to mention about uh, three-dimensional behavior is the strain energy, so the energy stored in the material uh, when you deform it. So for the linear elastic material, we've already seen this in, in the one-dimensional case. In the one-dimensional case, we had one-half stress times the strain. It gives me the strain energy density, so the energy per unit volume stored in the material. Well, in the multi-dimensional case, we have to account for the normal stresses in the y and the z direction, plus all the shear contributions. And each type of stress-strain pair that you have gives you one added term to the strain energy density. And so it, you, you get a fairly standard looking expression or extension of what we had before. We get one other term for normal strain and stresses in the y direction, normal stresses and strains in the z direction, and then the shear pairs in the xy, yz, and zx plane. So you just add those all together to give you the total strain energy. We'll need this uh, occasionally along the way, so I thought this was a good place to introduce it.